Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, Thomas Wolfe, the host of the radio program Word In Edgewise at KVMR in Nevada City, and Damian Schiff, a senior attorney at the uh, Pacific Legal Foundation. Uh, we're doing a little bit of digestion this week on uh, election results. We know that the uh, House was taken pretty, con pretty decisively by the uh, the, uh, the blue team, the red team, uh, maintained the Senate, even gained a seat or two. And libertarians had some wins as well, uh, mostly, well, almost exclusively at the local level. So let me go down the, down the list of libertarian 2018 November wins. 16 victors at the local level include, in Minnesota, three libertarians won their city council races. Ogle Parsons in Crystal, Minnesota. Nick Roll in Plymouth, Minnesota, and in Burnsville, Vince Workman, who will be joining uh, Libertarian National Committee candidate recruiting specialist and council member, uh, Kara Schultz, to the uh, uh, Burnsville City Council. Uh, he was they were elected to, uh, to a, 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 a four-year term. Uh, four Libertarians in Indiana have been elected to their town's leadership. They include Cheryl Hecox, for Greens Fork Township Advisor, Dean Hartley for Frank Franklin Township Advi uh, Board, Terry Kaufman for Liberty Township Board at Large, Jamie Owens for Liberty Township Trustee. In South Carolina, Artie Buxton won his bid for school board in Florence County's District 1, seat 5, with 68% of the vote. In Kentucky, three Libertarians have won their bids for Magistrate, Trevor Applegate in Mason County, Shannon Denniston in Montgomery County, and Shane Walker in Graves County. Cole Bell, who is the chair of the Libertarian Party of Tennessee, won a seat on the Carthage City Council in Tennessee. Uh, in fact, he came in number one out of, I think, uh, wow. six candidates, something like that. Right. Running as, a, it's a nonpartisan race, but everybody knew he was a Libertarian because he, in fact, owns uh, the only bar and restaurant in Carthage, Tennessee, the hometown of Cordell Hull and Al Gore Sr. The only one? Is that because they won't, uh, that's limited hmm? licensing? Is the only, the only bar? Restaurant? The first. The, the first, first oh, since okay. Prohibition. Oh, oh the first, so the family yeah, goes back. Yeah, the, yeah. Ban, the, the ban on, on serving liquor by the drink was sure. defeated a year or two ago. He was the first person who was able to get a, a bar and restaurant uh, 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 permitted and built uh, across from the courthouse, interestingly <laughs> enough, yeah, good. In, in, Carth <laughs> in Carthage, uh, Tennessee. Now these other ones, so uh, these, a lot of these are local. The local They're all local. Saying. Yeah, all local. Are any of them actually party specific? I mean, how do you know that all these people are libertarian? They're oh, they're they're all they're all declared libertarian. Oh, okay. Mo a lot of the, most of the, a lot if not all of the races, or most of the races, I guess I would say, oh, are, are nonpartisan. Right. But it's, it's like nonpartisan in any in any in any town. Everybody knows what yeah. the partisan label of everybody is. Everybody knows that Daryl Steinberg, the mayor of Sacramento, is a Democrat. And et cetera. But he doesn't run as a Democrat. I don't, I don't think it's partisan okay. in Sacramento. No. Anyway, so you know everybody knows what party they are. So it really, it's really kind of uh, kind of beside the point. The interesting thing that the Libertarian Party did in 2018 is build a base, build uh, the the farm team, build the talent at the local level yeah. of candidates and now office holders yeah. who can prove that they do know how right. to. Uh, govern. They do know how to play well with others. They do know how to uh, keep the, uh, well, we don't have trains to speak of anymore. Know how, I was going to say trains running in time, know how to, how to keep the, the streets paved, the potholes filled, right. and the, uh, and, and, and more to the point, city uh, pensions, uh, uh, local government pensions funded. One of the races which is still hanging fire is Jeff Hewitt running for county supervisor of Riverside County. Now that's a big county in Southern California. That still hasn't been decided. Though. Hasn't been decided. No. He was within a couple, of, you know, a few hundred votes of winning on election night, with I think it, uh, 30, 40 thousand votes yet to be counted. Mm -hmm. uh, absentee ballots right. and and provisional ballots and and people that voted uh, just last minute kind of stuff. The vote counting is still going on, so mm. he, he's still, I talked to him this afternoon, he's still, still hanging in the balance. And this is a guy who was elected as a libertarian, uh, again, nonpartisan, to be mayor, city council, and then mayor of Calamisa, a, a town within Riverside County. And he challenged the CalPERS pension program for the city of Calamisa. He got it taken out. The fire department is no longer CalPERS. They are now 401 or 403B or 401K. He was able to solve a little town's pension problem, which was severe, by switching it to a 401k, uh, and has earned the everlasting enmity of every public uh, union in, the, yeah. in existence. Well, that goes with it. And he's been able to 
he was able to you know, fight that off and come in number two in the top two primary back in June and come within, it looks like he may win, certainly coming in a very close second, uh, running on that issue, pension mm -hmm. reform, uh, having every uh, Janus prohibited mm -hmm. union fighting against him uh, to uh, prevent him from winning that seat. Mm -hmm. So uh, libertarians, I think, are, are, are poised to be the people in the room who know how to do arithmetic when it comes to public pensions yeah. and are willing to do, do the addition and subtraction and say, hey folks, you got a problem here. Okay. There's only one way to, to, to solve it and that's not to keep uh, doing what we've been doing, not to, not to repeat the same mistakes going over and over again. Um, there, a couple of the other races that are interesting is, well, one in, in particular comes to mind, which is the race for, for senator in Montana. John Tester was the Democratic incumbent, and he won. But he won courtesy, Republicans would say, of the Libertarian who got the margin of difference between him and the Republican. Oh, that argument. Tester got uh, like 49 and, and change. The Republican got 48 and change. Mm -hmm. the, the Libertarian got uh, a couple percent. Yeah, but that, uh, so, the, so the assumption is if he hadn't run, those votes would have gone to the Republican. But that is an assumption that I think that's based on just uh, people just decide that. I don't know that there's any logical way. I know that I would not, if I was voting Libertarian, you cannot assume my vote would have been for the Republican. If I didn't have a candidate worth voting for, I wouldn't have voted for the, for the office. Interesting, Cole LaBelle, who I talked to this afternoon and asked him about his election, he was running for city council. Mm -hmm. He's a guy, this is a guy, it's a town of 2400, Carthage, Tennessee. Oh, yeah. That's and he one. knocked on every door, not mm -hmm. likely voters, not registered right. voters, every door yeah. in town, he knocked on the door. That's the way you're supposed to do and, it. Well, <laughs> and that's, not what, that's not what political strategists would say. They would say, just talk to the likely voters, don't right. waste your time on, on right. non-voters. He talked to everybody and was able to get people who are non-voters because they don't like any of right. the duopoly sure. politicians, Republicans, and Democrats. <laughs> they, you know, so they don't register, they don't bother. They say to hell with you know, the pox on both your houses. He was able to talk to them door to door, mm -hmm. in front of their face, and register people. Yeah. Who it's came a human out connection. and voted and voted and voted for him? He called the election. He said, "I will get X number of votes." He called it within four votes. Whoa! Within four votes wow. of, of being accurate. This was how uh, effective the door-to-door -door campaigning was in a in a you know relatively small town, uh, which you know shows that it can be done. And he is now in a position where he can bring industry into a town which is solely lacking in industry. Mm. We're talking about. Uh, a, a, a town of 2,400, about an hour away from, from Nashville, uh, and its chief claim to fame is its uh, elder statesman who grew up there, Cordell Hall, who was Secretary of State during the Roosevelt administration, and I think won the Nobel Prize at some point, and Al Gore Sr., right. uh, and, and uh, uh, Al Gore Jr. actually made a stump speech back when he was uh, trying to run in a tobacco growing region, saying, mm -hmm. I picked uh, tobacco, I spiked it, I've, you know, really? whatever. Uh, this was before he became before a, he invented before he became the internet. <laughs> that, yeah, <laughs> before he invented the internet uh, and before he became a, an anti tobacco uh, right. uh, radical. Anyway, uh, his hometown. And, uh, but but it's, it's a dying town. The, the population has gone down 14% since 1982, mainly because the big tobacco plant in town or in the, in the county finally shut, up, uh, shut down. Mm. The new industry, interestingly enough, is hemp. When hemp is, it is, oh, is hemp. Hemp, it yeah, hemp. hemp. Oh, yeah. No, that's, uh, it grows hemp. in the same, same soil. Yeah, same, uh, yeah. Well, hemp grows anywhere. But uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, they're doing that. And it's also on the Cumberland River and another yeah. river nearby. So it's got a lot of net. It's in the mountains. It's got a lot of natural beauty. It's got a lot of uh, potential for river trips. Mm -hmm. And in the last year or two, a couple of people have set up shop as river guides to uh, take advantage of the, of the beauty and the natural resources of the area as a, as a tourism destination. So, you know, it's an interesting, an interesting story and it's, it's good because a libertarian councilman uh, will probably be able to be somebody who is instrumental, not, along with his bar and grill, along with his uh, support of, anti, of an anti-regulatory environment, mm -hmm. along with his support of uh, transparency in local government, don't let the good old boys run everything, he'll be able to prove that he can, in fact, uh, be a, a good enough person in government to eventually run for state representative, state senator, and his wife says he's going to be governor someday.
So, who and knows? as a libertarian, maybe that hemp industry, uh, maybe there'd be some more female plants, and they'll uh, find a whole yeah, other industry yeah. that's cro- you know taking. And the other thing about about libertarians as as, as spoilers, mm-hmm. Lucy Brenton, who was running for uh, uh, the Senate in Ohio, had the absolute best quote on that. She said. Uh, and I'm going to uh, paraphrase. Sure. She, she was asked, you know, are you going to be a spoiler? spoiler she got 4% yeah. of the uh, vote, and uh, the, the Republican Brown uh, ended up losing, I think. Mm-hmm. If I, no, he ended up winning. So she spoiled it. So she Democrat. spoiled for Democrat. Yeah. yeah. Well, make up your mind. Come on. Uh, but anyway, her, her comment was, you can't spoil something that's not rotten. Right. Yeah, right. I mean, and, and you, can't, you can't blame somebody who is running for somebody else not winning. I mean, we're all, they're all running against each other. That's just a ridiculous argument. That Here's somebody about. that, that uh, the libertarians, I think, in unison would say is rotten. Jeff Sessions got <laughs> fired. What's the good news? What's the bad news? Yeah. Well, well uh, this is something that, um, uh, that we were talking about, that we will be talking about in, in a future episode that will, um, that will show. Hmm. Uh, the uh, divide in the conservative or in the sort of Republican legal uh, community between conservatives and libertarians. And I mm. think there has been a change over the last 40 years in the uh, legal establishment on the right, moving from a conservative position to a more libertarian position. And I think Jeff Sessions represents uh, uh, some of the last bit of the old guard. Mm-hmm. Uh, his views of, um, of um, uh, the criminal justice system, on, um, on immigration, but more generally, I think his views maybe on the administrative state uh, are what you would have expected, say, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, in conservative Republican circles, that it's good for the judiciary to be uh, not um, uh, active, it's good for the judiciary to defer to the elected branches of government, mm-hmm. and uh, in particular, it's good for the uh, judiciary to um, to allow the, the criminal justice system uh, to um, to operate without creating a lot of procedural uh, impediments to no restraint. locking people up, lock right. them up, throw away the key. Exactly. Yeah. Now, part of that was born uh, out of the the Warren the Warren Court, where you did have uh, a lot of judicial invention, but that attitude carried over to a lot of other parts of the law that uh, uh, result in you know as we have been talking about, economic liberty not getting very much attention or solicitude uh, of um, administrative agencies getting a lot of deference from the courts. So I think Jeff Sessions represented that older part of the, uh, of the conservative legal establishment. And really, I, I think it's one that's not well shared. Even Justice Scalia, who used to be more like that towards the end of his life, definitely became much more uh, of a um, skeptic when it comes to, to, to government activity, mm-hmm. right. uh, whether it was uh, uh, from the prosecution or whether it was from an administrative agency. And I think even among um, legal lights, luminaries today who wouldn't call themselves libertarian, if you ask them their views on particular subjects, I think you'll find that the answers are much more libertarian friendly than they would have been, as I say, 20, 30, 40 years ago. But Jeff Sessions, I think, wouldn't have given those more libertarian answers. I think he represented that that um, last guard. Now, who will replace uh, yeah, uh, that's the Jeff question. Sessions? That's that's any, anybody's guess, and it, it's not clear necessarily whether you would have a more libertarian-leaning uh, replacement, but I do think that the number of people like Jeff Sessions in that sense uh, in the Republican legal establishment Dwindling. Is dwindling. Yeah, the number good. is dwindling. Yeah. Well, Jefferson Beauregard Sessions was one of the last drug warriors. He was the guy that uh, got rid of, I think, it was the Coal memora- Memorandum under the Obama administration, which essentially said that if the states have legalized cannabis, it's the, you know the federal government's not going to do any prosecution right. in that in that particular state. Right. But that was a memorandum. It didn't have a, it was, no, it was no, just it an understanding it, yeah. that we're just not. But it was a direct. It was a directive to. It was a directive to, to uh, federal prosecutors. Yeah, to not prosecute. Not don't prosecute in states where it's, where it's legalized. Of course, under federal law, it's still a category one drug. Like right heroin. Up, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, uh, right up there, yeah. which is absolutely insane. Uh, and, you know, you know uh, 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 interestingly enough, uh, the uh, Congress is actually taking up, or may, may take up the idea of uh, 
taking marijuana off schedule one, which uh, would be yeah. uh, in twenty eighteen. Tell us taking this long thing, intelligent to even thing talk to about. Do. But nevertheless, he was you know one of the last drug lawyers saying that heroin is only a little bit worse than 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 than, than heroin or marijuana is only a little bit worse than heroin. He's also the guy that said. Uh, if, if uh, and I'm paraphrasing, if, if, if parents uh, from Mexico bring their children across the border, they're illegal, and if we have to, you know, it's not our fault they did that, and if we have to, you know, if we have to separate them and put the children in one yeah. cage and the parents in another cage, that's their problem, it's, it's not our fault. Mm -hmm. uh, even Trump was embarrassed and chagrined and, uh, you know, walked that one back, and that's, that's pretty amazing when you can get... Uh, uh, Donald J. Trump to back off I'm, I'm, on something that has to do with immigration. Sure. I was amazed. I, I'm guessing it wasn't his own. I'm guessing that's voices in his ear uh, telling you, <laughs> you need to, you know, close to him. You need to, you need to back this off. This is not going to look good for you. Yeah. I don't know that he would have come to that. I got to say about Jeff Sessions, so while it is, yes, a net good that he's not the guy anymore, he wasn't let go because he's old guard or because of his knee jerk opinions. He was no, let he was go like, for one thing because he recused himself yeah. in the Mueller. Uh, investigation yeah. and it's becoming a bigger and bigger embarrassment and issue for Trump. So we, it's put a, a lot of kind of uh, civil liberty people at this weird position like, yay, get rid, oh, wait a minute, what are we replacing him with and what is yeah. the reason and it's an awkward time Well, right the, now. The, the interim uh, replacement is a right. guy, his uh, what, deputy? Mark, what, no, what's uh, his name? Yeah, Whitaker. Whitaker right. who, has, it was never confirmed for anything. He's just a, you know, so, you know, it's, there's a, some people are, are questioning whether there's, whether it's a legal appointment. Whether it's even is, is it a legal appointment uh, from a legal standpoint? <laughs> no comment. Uh, <laughs> ongoing. Well, it, well looks, uh, it, yeah. it may get litigated, who knows, but he's, he's interim in any case. Uh, but he's also a person who has been uh, a pretty vocal uh, opponent of the Mueller investigation, right. uh, saying that it's a witch hunt and, you know, basically echoing the, right. the Trump Twitter feed uh, as to the, uh, the efficacy of the investigation. Now, I don't uh, have a, a dog, a pony in that, or a dog in that fight. I don't, I don't know whether Mueller is on to something. I don't know whether he's not. Right. Don't really care. Because it's under wraps. We don't uh, know. Well, you, you, know. you could object, though, to the institution of the independent counsel. And, um, and a lot of uh, libertarian, um, conservative, um, Thinker, legal thinkers would object because you're basically saying giving an unlimited uh, uh, budget to an investigator who can uncover anything anywhere with uh, having anything to do with uh, with anybody and not subject and to in an in an in an era and in an in an age where we all commit according to one very uh, well researched well, book three felonies a that's day a, that, you can get anybody yeah. for anything yeah but also to the fact that it's a unitary executive and and um, uh, the president, as I understand, has um, uh, the idea is the president uh, is the one who directs the enforcement of the laws. So to have someone who is operating independent of that uh, seems to, it's harder to reconcile with the separation of powers. Now, the Supreme Court upheld the independent counsel, right. but uh, I think there are uh, many libertarian conservative legal scholars who, who are concerned about that. But when it's the president himself or herself, as may be the case at some point, that's being investigated, that that calls, I think, just think conflict of interest notions should call for some kind of independence. It shouldn't be, uh, uh, I'm being investigated, I'm going to appoint this person to be in charge of that investigation. That just reeks of obvious. Yeah, but then you can say, I mean, there's a pretty easy political uh, remedy. I mean, it, you if vote them out. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if the president uh, is not. Well, and Congress has investigatory powers as well. And also, Congress has the power of impeachment and removal. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so I hint, hint. <laughs> so I think um, uh, I think that there are adequate ways of of, being, of of addressing that concern about a president who you know, is not going to investigate himself without necessarily the, the separation of powers issues that are raised by having an independent counsel who is, I guess, subject to the attorney general. But then, to what extent is he subject to the president himself? Well, I just hope they don't uh, appoint Chris Christie because that, that would probably be. Was that from, is that he would, being that floated? Be, that, yeah, that would be even worse. Are you kidding me? No, I'm not. Uh, so much for the good news, okay. bad news. That's really bad news. Anyway, uh, more libertarian uh, election results. Uh, there were four libertarians. Yeah, actually, yeah, reasonably good news. Okay. There were four libertarians running for uh, office in D.C., in Washington D.C. Washington D.C. All, All of right. them, uh, coincidentally, were gay. We had uh, Joe and Ethan Bishop Henchman. Uh, a, married, a married right? couple. Yeah. They ran for 
Uh, they ran in, uh, one ran for the D.C. Council Chair and the other one ran for the D.C. Attorney General. Right. And both of them got a higher vote total than the highest vote-getting Republican nice. in any D.C. race. Good. So, you know, uh, the uh, Libertarian Party is now officially the, the, uh, the second uh, So they didn't actually... Party. They didn't they actually didn't win. Didn't win yeah, because, they, I mean, uh, you, have, Democrats you have Democrats right. basically owning Washington, D.C. Well, that's good that's that the Libertarian's right. coming in ahead of the Republicans. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a step, you know, it's a step in the right direction. It's sort of like biting the tail of the beast. Now we have to bite the head well, of the beast. To, you have to keep working but, your way up the end. But, uh, yeah, uh, th there's that. Uh, and then two other uh, Libertarians were Bruce <laughs> Majors and uh, Martin, Mold uh, Mar Martin Moulton. They both uh, also re polled respectably, both gay guys uh, polled respectably in, in the D.C. races. Um, now, I don't want to leave the impression that all libertarian candidates are gay. But, but all the ones in D.C. were? They were there. And, and, certainly, and, the Democrats and, and certainly all gays are welcome to the Libertarian Absolutely. Party. Absolutely. Everybody. Uh, transsexuals yeah. are, people are, are, are welcome in the Libertarian Party. All open carry advocates are welcome in the Libertarian yeah. Party. Uh, in fact, we Marijuana stand up. enthusiasts. We stand up for the, the freedoms and the rights of everybody all the time. Right. And that's, that's kind of the creed. And, and that message is getting out more and more. For a, while, for a long time, it's been the fringe thing. A lot, you know, people well, don't even know what the means. Because all of these groups at one time were fringe. Right, right. Many of them aren't anymore. Uh, but there's still fringe groups out there. Mm -hmm. And they have a home with the Libertarian Party it's like because not we, we, yeah, well, that there is that. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the very basic non, principle of Libertarian is we, we say don't hurt people, don't take their stuff, mm -hmm. don't break your word, violate a contract, right. and most importantly, don't hire government thugs to do it for you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and call it good. Yeah. Uh, the Trump administration uh, officials have now b reportedly listened to the tape that Turkish intelligence uh, took or made of the assassination, the, the, the torture and killing of uh, uh, Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi, uh, including the, uh, report, uh, the, the, the report back to the boss by telephone mm -hmm. that uh, one of the uh, executioners made who said, the deed is done. Yeah. And the Trump administration's response has been? I haven't heard anything. You're supposed to say silent a little yeah. longer. Okay, sorry. Uh, but I have what, I, what did get confirmed in what I read today. Uh, you know, there was talk about what was the order of events and did they chop his body up afterward? And no, apparently he was taken apart while alive. That was confirmed as part of a suppression of the media. I think this is a... It's one person, it's one life. This has been pointed out before. When, you know, when it's huge numbers, we don't care as much. Why do we care about this one? Well, as, as, as Stalin said, if one person is killed, it's a tragedy. Right. If a million are killed, it's a statistic. Uh, and that applies in particular in this case. We have all of the sympathy in the world for Jamal Khashoggi, who was, by all accounts, a fairly, you know, a decent man, right. a fair journalist, uh, you know, a liberalizing influence on the uh, medieval regime that rules sure. in Saudi Arabia. But at the same time, the, that medieval regime that's ruling Saudi Arabia is conducting warfare against one of the sides in the civil conflict in yeah. Yemen, right. the Sunni side of the conflict while Iran is supporting the Shiite side mm -hmm. of the conflict. It's a civil war proxy between war. Shiites and Sunnis. It's a proxy war between, essentially between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And we, since we, for whatever reason, don't like Iran as well as we like Saudis. And I don't really understand why we well, like I, Saudis I so I do much. understand. And let me explain the reason why we like the Saudis. Uh, it goes back to the 1970s when uh, Nixon took the U.S. off the gold standard. Right. There was the danger of imminent inflation unless something was done to make the dollar valuable in the world of fiat currencies. What happened was Nixon dispatched Henry Kissinger to Saudi Arabia to say to the medieval family that runs the country, mm -hmm. we will protect your uh, medieval evil regime with military might. We will protect you. We'll keep you on the throne as long as you price oil in dollars. Right. The right. petrodollar was born, mm -hmm. which means that if you are any country in the world and you want to buy Saudi oil, and they were and still are one of the largest producers of oil in the world, if you want to buy Saudi oil, 
or really oil anywhere in the global market, you got to buy dollars mm -hmm. first, mm -hmm. which creates a huge demand for dollars as right. a currency if you want to buy oil. And of course, there are many countries, China, India, uh, some of the largest, uh, and, and every other non-oil producer, they have to buy dollars mm -hmm. before they can buy oil. Mm -hmm. So that's the deal that was made. And that's the deal that Trump wants to protect. Of course. Because he doesn't want the dollar to go south, which is, you know, understandable. Yeah, but there are things you, there are, there but, has to be lines, there has to be moral but the, it's and ethical understandable, lines. But it's wrong. Yeah, it's absolutely wrong. And, and, and I would say, back to the point about this being one person, my feeling of it isn't, um, I feel so, it isn't so much going out to him, it's what he represents. He, this is a dissident um, uh, journalist being taken out because by the did. powers that be that feel threatened by his words. And this is happening mm -hmm. in a time, we talked about this I think last week or, we or a couple weeks ago, happening in the same, at a time when our very own president is at an unprecedented level of uh, dukes up against our press here in this country, calling people stupid, saying their questions are stupid, Acosta's uh, revoking his uh, well, White he, House yeah, press. Yeah, he, he hasn't, it hasn't descended quite yet to torture, to, right, torture, torture and murder. murder but if but, uh, you kicking know, some out people of the White had House, their druthers, yeah. It, well, yeah, I mean, this is it, important. It, it, well, it, it. I think this is important. This might be a turning point. This is the kind of thing that could, I believe, could turn more and more conservatives, especially real conservatives, against this weird Trump phenomenon, which is not American conservatives. Well, it's not, no, it's populism. And, and I think that's the thing that has to be understood. I mean, Trump has done some things that we would agree with. Sure. He's Everything's, done, there's a Venn diagram. We've said yeah, that before. Yeah. Some things are going to be right. Some policies are going to. But know, he doesn't believe in anything. He does it by accident. Of course not. Of course not. And, and, and his only real uh, belief is what will get him right. reelected, what will keep him in the White House, what will keep him out of jail, probably. Uh, and but this a, phenomenon, you know, the, what the, the movement that he kind of rode in on yeah, is, a, yeah, is, a, is a form of right wing that's not even from America, I believe. It's like a European Well, right no, wing. it's a Huey Long kind of thing. Well, I don't no, remember. He was Huey, Huey Long was the King was nationalist. The king, king, yeah, uh, Louisiana, and, and he, was, he was bad news. Tribalist. Uh, tribalist, popul populist, yeah. uh, governor of, uh, you know, basically a spoil system. Uh, governor of Louisiana, huh. and he, you know, rode the spoil system to to dominance, and eventually, uh, fell, uh, you know, was hoisted on his own petard, and and, and was, uh, I, I don't, know, I met a bad end. I can't remember what it was, yeah. but that's the kind of thing that's happening here, and it's based on the understanding by Americans mm -hmm. that somehow the middle class Americans that somehow they're getting the short end of the stick because they are. don't know really why or how. Yeah. Trump understands they're getting the short end of the stick. He doesn't have a solution, right. but he speaks to them. Yeah. That's what's happening. That's the show. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place, on the Libertarian Counterpoint. And we hope that you are able to join us. Thank you. <laughs>